Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Mount Clemens Bicentennial Fashion Show and Tea. I want to thank each and every one of you for supporting this event. Um, we have been trying to do several different events throughout our bicentennial. You will see fashions from 1818 to 2018, and since I'm the model for 2018, this is what you get. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now the real models will really show you what to do. <laughs> First of all, I'm Barb Dempsey. I'm the mayor of Mount Clemens. So, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I want to take just a few minutes to thank our Bicentennial Committee. We're few, but we're mighty. And um, I don't know, they're all around back there, and I know if I say stand up, you're not going to see them all. And I'm not going to go through all the names. They know who they are. They've done a fantastic job. We did this in two and a half hours. So <laughs> and it was a lot of preparation. I do want to mention Jenny. Um, Jennifer, I don't know where are you, Jennifer? She's, oh, she's there, she is coming. This young lady did all of the um, programs, <clears throat> my throat's going, um, programs and your um, bookmarks. So I want to thank her for it. Did a great job. Plus everything else, she took your reservations and she was just all around everywhere. Um, I don't know how many of you have been here before, and the ones who haven't, uh, this uh, building opened in 1921, and it was a theater in a vaudeville, movie theater in vaudeville. And our, in around 1987, it started to change hands, and it's been many different things since then. The current owner, Mr. John Hanna, bought this a few years ago, and his idea was to restore it back to a theater. So he does have concerts, and he's building his genre to do more and more here, but he has done a lot of restoration to bring it back, as you can see from the sides, to its original um, glory that it was. So I do want to thank John uh, tremend tremendously that he has given up a couple days for us. Uh, he's lending us the theater today, and we had a bootlegger's ball. And you guys missed the bootleggers ball. That was fantastic. So um, hopefully they want to do it next year again. So if I can get a committee together, we might just do that. That was fun. I think what we're going to do now is we're going to start the show. I don't want to hold anything up. Eat while, you're, uh, while we're watching the show. You can buy raffle tickets. We have raffle tickets. We have Debbie Larson, who wrote the book, our book, um, Bicentennial book. She's in the back. She's selling, uh, we're selling the books and she'll even autograph it for you. So 200 years from now, <laughs> your, your children will be looking at it. <laughs> and uh, we also have um, uh, the hat lady. I call her the hat lady. <laughs> um, the hats are for sale and she makes all of them. So I think it's kind of neat. So uh, visit her if you can. We just wanted to have a little extra touch for this afternoon. Enjoy the show. I will be back later. We will be coming around to fill your teapots, so let us know. We're kind of wandering around, and we'll take care of that. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce, I think, Casey. I think. Casey, are you here? Am I introducing you or your mom? <laughs> are you next? Are you, or am I introducing your mother? Yes, please. Okay, this is Casey Curtola, and Casey's mom is the one that owns all these beautiful gowns, and I'm going to let Casey introduce her mother and tell you a little bit about what we're doing, okay? Okay, all yours. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm thrilled you're all here, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy the show. And uh, I wish I was down there sitting at the tables, those tea sandwiches and desserts look wonderful. My mother started collecting vintage clothes well over 50 years ago, and it started as a project for the hospital, St. Joseph Hospital, when it was on North Avenue. 
and uh, she joined the auxiliary. My father was a doctor there, and she joined the auxiliary when they first came to Mount Clemens. In around 1962 or three, they gave her an assignment to have a fundraiser to raise money for the hospital, gave her no budget and no idea, but said, it has to be fabulous. So she went home and brainstormed and was walking, was, was seeing children on the street play, uh, running up and down in vintage clothes, presumably from their grandparents or mother or whatever. So she decided that would be a good idea to have a vintage fashion show. So she, she found out where the clothes came from and approached the people, and a lot of them they, she knew, and they agreed to let her borrow some of their clothes, and then they went back up into their attics to look for more clothes, and that was her first fashion show. Since then, we have done, when I say we, she has corralled many members of the family, starting with us kids, we all modeled, we all helped set up and everything, and it, then it went to uh, daughter-in-laws, then grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. So it's been a family affair, and the collection, her collection grew and grew and grew, because people, nine times out of 10, would just give her clothes that they found in their attics, found in their closets after their mothers or grandmothers passed away. So our, our collection is, her collection is quite extensive, and over and above the items that she bought herself, a lot of the items were, like I said, donated, and we have a lot in, our, in her collection that, that are directly, directly related to people from, that lived in Mount Clemens. So that really ties into the theme of our tea here today, the bicentennial of the founding of Mount Clemens. My mother now is 93 years old, and I don't know if all of you have Facebook, but I put on Facebook last night, I don't think she knows this, but she was on her, we were putting all the clothes together and putting them in bags, and she wanted to tie the bottom of the bag so the clothes didn't get dirty. I wasn't gonna get down there, my knees aren't that great. She went down on her hands and knees many, many times. And then the next thing you know, she's ironing and didn't go to bed until about 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so, lots of energy. The key to being healthy and live long is to stay busy. So without further ado, my mother, Ginny Curatolo. It's so nice to have you all here for my last fashion show. This has been a, a lot of fun through the years, and I could not do it without my daughter Karen, of course. But uh, it's so nice to be a part of this bicentennial celebration. And before I start with the models, I have a little poem that I'm going to read. And I think it kind of tells you about the first model that's going to come out. Grandmother, on a winter's day, milked the cows and slopped the hogs, saddled the mule and got the children off to school. She did a washing and mopped the floors, washed the windows and did some chores, cooked a dish of homemade fruit, and trussed her husband's Sunday suit. She swept the parlor and made the bed and baked a dozen loaves of bread. She split some firewood and brought it in, enough to fill the kitchen bin, cleaned the lamps and put in oil, stewed some apples that she thought might spoil. She churned the butter and baked the cake and then exclaimed, for goodness sakes, 
the calves have gotten out of the pen. And she went out and chased them in again. She gathered the eggs and closed the stable, went back to the house and set the table and cooked a dinner that was just delicious and afterwards washed all the dishes. She fed the cat and she sprinkled the clothes and mended a basket full of hose and then opened the organ and began to play when you come to the end of a perfect day. And our first model, the Pioneer, is coming out and showing the costume that she would wear. Jess Jessica is our first model. And Jessica's, Jessica's wearing, she's wearing a fine cotton two-piece outfit, which is very subtle peach and print with, with dots, and narrow lace trims the collar and cuffs on the blouse. The bodice buttons at the front. A lovely white cotton half apron is worn over the skirt and features very large pockets and ties with a bow in the back. Note the very wide fillet crochet work that trims the bottom. Our model, Jessica, has just returned from the chicken coop where she gathered the eggs. <laughs> to protect her face from the sun, she wears a sunbonnet. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Linda and Kathy are modeling some intricate fashions that I found in a trunk that belonged to my husband's grandmother, Brigida Rizzo. She brought the trunk with her when she uh, uh, came to this country from Trapani, Sicily in 1917. Linda is wearing underpinnings or unmentionables from 1890. <laughs> Fillet crochets trims the camisole that ties at the neckline and the waist with a narrow ribbon. Her petticoat features many horizontal pin tucks and a lace flounce uh, covers the uh, hemline, and perhaps you guessed, she's wearing pantaloons. <laughs> Kathy is wearing her great-grandmother's Mother Hubbard nightgown. Ruffles de decorates the neckline and sleeves. There are many pin tucks that are sewn into the yoke of this gown. And to top it off, she's wearing a nightcap and carrying a candle to to make her way to bed. Thank you, Kathy and Linda. <laughs> Sue is with us now. And Sue is wearing a riding suit that might have been worn for the horse and buggy ride or the horseless carriage ride into town. This heavy black wool suit features a fully lined skirt. There's a slight fullness in the back, and the coat is fitted and has a split tail detail in back. Puff sleeves taper to the wrists and are trimmed with glass buttons. Glass buttons also are evident that, as well as in the uh, back of the uh, coat as well as in the front of the coat. To top it off, she's wearing a smart hat that's tied down with a black with a silk scarf. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> the late 1800s and early 1900s shows a popular style that is a two-piece Lego mutton shirtwaist dress. Lori is wearing this. The balloon sleeves, uh, uh, they accent a small waist. There are, they are very full and puffy from the shoulders to the elbows, 
and then from the elbows to the wrists, they taper down. She's carrying a stereoscope. Many homes were equipped with these, along with a selection of photo cards that provided a 3D effect when viewing. Thank you, Lori. Fleur is with us now, and she's wearing a gown from the turn of the last century. It's a full skirt with wide ruffles along the, the uh, drum. In, okay, okay. Wide ruffles that drop from the, sh from the uh, shoulder to form each sleeve. Shearing is evident in the dress, and it creates a puckered effect. A faint bustle sometimes was worn with its costume like this. Fleur is wearing a cameo in a, but it's tied with a pink satin ribbon. And that complements this fanciful ensemble. Thank you. Is here. I've got my grandchildren mixed up. Elise, Elise is here. Elise is my granddaughter, and she has her daughter with her, Rhea, and Rhea is my great granddaughter. And this is her second fashion show. <laughs> Elise is wearing a dress from the early 1900s, and this shows much detail in the inserts of lace on the bodice and sleeves. A cummerbund belt snaps in front, and the skirt has an illusion of a wraparound style, and it's decorated with silk buttons down the front. Smocking is evident in, on the shoulders and on the back of the skirt. The glass beads that are sewn are in the sailor collar. The beaded lace decorates the bodice in front. And a perky hat with a vintage rose completes this very special occasion. And Rhea is carrying her, well, first of all, she's wearing a dress fashioned from very lightweight wool. The dress is, has a feature and of intricate uh, designs of white soutache embroidery at the sleeves, neckline, and hem. There are seven panels in this fully lined dress, and it buttons down the front. Soutache is a narrow, flat, decorative braid used to trim clothing, daipri, vape, and, and it was also used for hiding seams. And Rhea is carrying her favorite teddy bear. <laughs> teddy bears were a favorite toy for children in the early 1900s in honor of President Teddy Roosevelt. President Roosevelt was a great hunter, and in one of his hunts, he refused to shoot a bear. And the teddy bear became a very big issue with President Roosevelt, and he will always be remembered. Thank you. And now we have Emily, another granddaughter. And she's showing us the costume. It's a gym suit from the 1900. This is all wool, and it's a bloomer style and it bears a Lansing, Michigan label. Physical fitness became an important pastime, and women demanded more comfortable attire after exercise and recreation. 
Hoops similar to today's hula hoop were used for the various exercises of the time. The same, the name Bloomer came from Amelia Bloomer, who was a champion of women's rights. She became famous for her Turkish pantaloons. She wore bloomers when she lectured, and she always drew great clouds. Thank you, Emily. Now, we have Michelle. On a rainy afternoon in 1910, an army of matrons, an army of bright-eyed young girls trudged down New York's Fifth Avenue to demand an American right denied only to criminals, lunatics, idiots, and women. <laughs> this fashion depicts the moment, the movement of the woman's suffrage. The look also became popular a few years later because of the French nurses during World War I. Skirts were about nine inches from the ground, and Michelle is wearing this two-piece suit with a loosely fitted jacket that is trimmed with buttons and braid. A belt buttons the front and has little flaps at the hips that are also trimmed with buttons. A, lo a lovely hat sets off this military look, along with the all-important protest sign that she carries and protest banner that she wears across her chest. Thank you, Michelle. Now we have Vicki. Shapes were beginning to disappear, and this dress is typical of the era. It's a cotton net trimmed with fine embroidery work at the neckline. A single ruffle is sewn along the bust line. Fifteen ruffles adorn the skirt. The edge of each ruffle is trimmed with narrow satin ribbon. A yellow satin sash ties at the waistline. And Vicki is carrying a paper parasol. These became very popular during this era. A tremendous oriental influence was evident during this time. A game called Mahjong played with tiles. Kimonas and paper parasols entered the scene and became very popular. Thank you, Vicki. Now, we have Elise back, and she's wearing a fashion from 1917. This straight line dress is trimmed with lace inserts in the waist and hemline. Purple steel beads trim the, both the bodice and the skirt. The dress is worn over a delicate matching slip. She is wearing blue beads, And I guess that's it. We don't have, <laughs> we don't have the first. <laughs> Sometimes when people come out, I will tell you they're wearing a purse or a hat, and it's not there. <laughs> <laughs> and now, we have something real special. In 1922, Chicago police arrested bathing beauties such as these for indecent exposure. <laughs> these fashionable, and I might add, itchy, all wool suits were popular for beach wear. And after the initial uh, shock, they finally became a decent cover-up for the respectable bathing beauties of the decade. The first America contest was held in 1920. Resort owners promoted it to keep vacationers 
on the beach after Labor Day. The first contest had eight contestants, and by 1924, 83 girls entered. The owner, the winner, Miss Philadelphia, measured 34, 24, 34, and weighed a hefty 137 pounds. Today our Miss Americas are Jessica, Linda, and Fleur. Thank you, girls. This is, Kathy is back, and this time she's wearing a Paris original. I am told it was actually worn by a French countess in the late 20s or early 30s. This tiny, the, there are tiny white beads sewn throughout the dress, and some are forming intricate floral designs. Uh, also beading is outlines the neckline and the short sleeves. And notice the little dangling balls that cover uh, around the bottom. Kathy is also wearing the ever popular feathered headpiece. And she's carrying a cigarette <laughs> holder. And she's wearing a nifty sash around her hips. Genevieve Vladev, a former Mount Clemens resident, gave me this lovely Paris original. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Sue is back, and she's wearing a soft velvet dress. This is also from the 20s. This is a longer version of the shorter flapper style. Three tiers of velvet form the skirt, which has bias cut drapes that flow softly on each side. The dress features a round neckline, and the blouse is decorated with flowers that are made from the same velvet fabric. To complete the flapper look, our model is wearing a scarf and, of course, a long dangling pearls. And I have to add, Sue was out earlier in a riding suit, and she'll be out again later. And Sue has been a model for me for many, many years. Thank you, Sue. Also, I want to mention about this dress. Uh, it was um, a gift to me from a dear friend, Ruth Cowan. Many of you probably remember Ruth. Ruthie was a well-known and much-loved figure from the Mount Clemens area. She was also a pianist for many of my fashion shows. Thank you, Sue. Myla is here, and she's showing us a delicate silk straight-line flapper-style dress with a simple neckline. Five clear glass buttons trim the front of the dress below the waist. The skirt below the waist is bias-cut, allowing the costume to flare out from the bottom. A single rose made from the same fabric is attached to the hip. The subtle orange, yellow, and gray floral print is worn over a matching slip. She is also wearing the ever flapular, the ever popular cloche hat and long pearls and is carrying a Whiting Davis purse. Thank you, Maya. Very pretty. Now we have a beautiful, delicate, embroidered fringed sawl that's worn over a 
beautiful, straight-lined fashion dress from the 20s. This fine cotton net dress that Lori is wearing is trimmed with magnificent embroidery and crochet work, including the sailor collar with flowers and leaf designs. Throughout the dress, there are intricate inserts of crochet work that have many pin tucks in the waist and hemlines. This style with its short, straight uh, style became very popular in the 20s. This is one of several fashions that I purchased at the state of sale of Flossie LaPointe. Flossie was the wife of Tiger baseball player and Mount Clemens businessman, Archie LaPointe. Thank you, Laurie. If you notice, I'm trying to give you a little history of this bicentennial year. Okay, we have a little, fashion, a little time here, so I'm going to mention a few things. The, um, the Hollywood influence in, in uh, fashion was very, very prominent. And there are a couple of things that I will point out. One was when Clark Gable almost put men's undershirt company out of business when in the movie, it happened one night, he removed his shirt to reveal that he was not wearing one. And this is his undershirt. He was not wearing an undershirt. And that almost put the undershirt people out of business. But Marlon Brando brought them back at a later date. <laughs> and in the 50s, women preferred not to wear hats. That and the fact that the Catholic Church lifted the ban on women wearing hats to church put a crimp on the hat industry. Sometimes we have a little glitch, we need a pen or something to make some of these things work. A few other f facts that I have, I'll mention are inventions, and you possibly already know these. But in 1849, Walter Hunt invented the safety pin. He sold the rights for $100. Can you imagine? And according to Google, Dougal, Gideon Sundback, a Swedish-American engineer invented the modern zipper. And in 1950, a Swiss inventor was hunting in the mountains in Switzerland, and he observed burrs connecting together on his dog, and he invented Velcro. Okay, so now we have Kathy back, and she's wearing a satin, double-breasted coat dress that is fully lined in buttons in front. Long, narrow ties are connected at the neckline and can be fashioned in many ways. The straight line of this costume is typical of the flapper era, and the garment has a concealed interior secret pocket to flat stash a flash of booze. This was common during the speakeasy days during Prohibition. Her cloche hat and dangling pearls were necessary accessories of the 20s. These were wild times with crooked politicians, bathtub gin, gangsters such as Al Capone, and George Bugsy Moran. Thank you, Kathy.
And this is something else. The 20s brought some wild times and Michelle is wearing a stunning style from 1925. Somebody turned off my light. The waistlines dropped or they disappeared and bosoms were flattened. The decade was called the Roaring Twenties and roar they did. The daring flapper wore bright red lipsticks, rouged her knees, smoked cigarettes, drank booze, and dance the black bottom and the Charleston. This gorgeous dress is completely covered with glass beads, which makes it extremely heavy. It features a fishtail hem at the back, and it, it dips to a longer length in the back. She is also wearing a feathered headpiece, a feathered boa, and long black gloves, and a cigarette holder. Thank you, Mickey. This navy chiffon fabric in this gown that Emily is wearing is trimmed with machine embroidered flowers. These represent inserts and gives an illusion of stripes. They are fashioned horizontally on the short sleeve blouse and panels on the skirt are bias cut and arranged in the diagonal pattern. A 10 inch metal zipper is placed on the left side of the gown for easier opening. To the, these, these zippers uh, replaced snap enclosures that were put on the side of the dress that were supposed to make that easier for you to get into. This was uh, this, it was the uh, designer, Elsa Schiaparelli, who placed zippers down women's backs that made gowns and dresses easier for women to get into. And to complete this look, our model wears short pearls and she carries a lovely little glass beaded bag Thank you, Emily. Fleur is back and she's ready to celebrate in a brand floral print gown. This features spaghetti straps with darling butterfly the sleeves at the shoulder and a ruffle of the same appears in the neckline. This gown from the 30s shows us the glamorous, sleek look and in fashion of the era. Thank you, Fleur. You look lovely. And now we have my granddaughter Emily back and she's with her daughter Rosa. Emily is showing us a pretty detailed silk dress. The design is a straight line fashion with a built-in wrap-around skirt. A zipper reaches all the way down the center back. Triple net ruching decorates the neckline and follows the edge of these three-quarter length sleeves. A rhinestone brooch adorns the blouse, and she's wearing a clip-on beige satin hat that's embellished with a uh, satin bow and a little mink, uh, a rose, mink rose. And uh, she's wearing, no? gloves. <laughs> She's wearing a Whiting and Davis purse. Thank you, Emily. And now we're going to talk about Rosa. 
Rosa is wearing a, a little girl's yellow organdy dress, and doesn't she look absolutely magnificent? Her dress has three ruffles on the skirt, and a duffel, double ruffle follows the uh, neckline on the bodice. And a natural waistline is tied with a yellow satin ribbon. She's carrying a Japanese paper parasol. How sweet you two are. Thank you so much, Emily and Rosa. So now we have another little, uh, a little time to uh, When we talk about fashion, we think fashion is fabric and design. And there are so many fabrics in today's world. But in the early years, in the early years, they were limited to cotton, wool, linen, silk, and denim. And in the 1920s, a new fabric came to the United States from England, and they called it rayon. In the United States, it was originally called fake or artificial silk. It was man-made using wood pulp and chemicals, I'm sure. Then World War II gave us nylon, a fabric so strong that it was taken over by the military to make parachutes. After the war, it became very popular. And other synthetic fabrics were introduced, such as polyester and kiana, that offered durability, insulation, and wrinkle resistance. And spandex was added to many fabrics to offer a better fit. And I was very happy about that. <laughs> OK, Michelle, she was pinch hitting for one of our models that had a disaster in her family. And she's wearing a black sleeveless cocktail dress also from the 30s, and it's worn over a full black slip. The delicate dress features a low-cut round neckline in front and even lower neckline in back. There's an interesting and unique drop V waistline that flares out slightly to the hemline. On the left side of the dress is a 9-inch placket with snaps. These are, an, there is also an overlay of black lace which has butterfly sleeves that ties in the front. Thank you, Michelle. That was a quick change for Michelle. But we have to, we have to deal with these things, as you know. Nothing, nothing goes right all the time. Now we have another Emily, and she's wearing this stylish gown that was typical of the costumes of the glamorous 30s. The silk fabric is bias cut, giving a flared look to the gown. The gown features butterfly cap sleeves and has a sash that ties at the waistline. Also, it has a snap placket at the left side. This gown is accompanied by a red velvet cape. Hollywood had a tremendous influence in this fashion road, uh, the fashion world, and the focus was being on glamour. And this gown and cape was, was from the closet of Mount Clemenite, Roberta Nunley, and was given to me by her daughter, Jean MacArthur. 
Thank you, Emily. And we have Maya back, and she's wearing a cocktail dress from the 30s. And this is a little longer than the typical flapper dress from the 20s, and it features a brown velvet skirt, ecru lace ne neckline and bodice, both front and back, small butterfly cap sleeves are set into the shoulders, and the soft velvet dot bias cut skirt is trimmed at the hemline with the same intricate lace that's on the bodice. Maya compliments this with a rhinestone brooch and bracelet. And, and gloves and a beaded drawstring purse. And this is another dress that I got from my dear friend Ruthie Cohen. Ruthie Cowan. Thank you very much. Beautiful. It's amazing how we were able to get some of these people to wear these very, very tiny costumes, and they're doing such a good job. And now Elise is back, and she's wearing a smart crepe dress from the, tw from the this is also from the 30s. This one is designed to take the wearer from the afternoon to evening in great style. The black crepe dress is trimmed with blue yarn and has lovely rhinestone closures. And to add to the sophistication of this outfit is a small silver fox cape and fur muff. And furs like these were very popular and were sometimes complete with little heads and tails of little critters. <laughs> this dress is another outfit from the closet of Roberta Nunley that her daughter gave to me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I guess I'll have a l to give you another little story. <laughs> and this will be all about me. S some people wonder why I started this collection of vintage clothes. Uh, one time a woman came up to me and said, Oh, I know you. You're the lady with the old clothes. <laughs> and I said, I prefer to call them vintage. <laughs> but I started this when I first came to Mount Clemens, and I joined the hospital auxiliary. And of course, they gave me a job right away as program chairman. But they didn't have anything to fund it. So I had to come up with a spectacular program to try to encourage women to join the auxiliary. So I saw some little children walking down Wilson Street, if you know Mount Clemens at all. A lot of lovely, beautiful homes on this street. And little children were walking up and down in some vintage clothes. So I decided there must be some women that have some clothes in their attics. So I contacted many of them, and I got enough clothes to do my first fashion show. And it was very successful. It, it, it gave me the idea when they put the little arbor here. My first show, the carpenter at the hospital made me a big picture frame that the models walked up to. They, they uh, posed, and then they walked through. And uh, it, it, was, it was such fun. 
I decided I was going to start collecting and start doing fashion shows for charitable organization. And of course, I have done well over 50 shows through the years. The, uh, it was interesting how easy it was to get models to, to uh, participate in my shows. So many women were very excited to be invited to try on these clothes and be able to do a little walk down the stage and uh, show off a little bit. And as many of my models that I first started with uh, stayed with me for, for many, many years. In fact, uh, it, practically every one of my family, the, all the girls, the grandchildren, have modeled for me throughout the years. They started modeling in l the little dresses that you saw my great-grandchildren wearing, and then they kept modeling and, and kept growing. And uh, it was a very, very uh, fun thing for the family as well. Everybody got involved, everybody, even my husband. He took pictures and everybody was helping me pack the car and I'd have people that would come and help me sew in some of the fashions that were starting to deteriorate because there's always a lot of work to do when, you're, when you have vintage clothes. Uh, all of the wool and most of the wool clothes if, if they have been kept away from moths, uh, they do very well. And all the cotton uh, clothes that I have, they've been washed and ironed many, many times, and they have been in the, in the shows forever. Barbara Dempsey needs to say something. Oh, so okay. Take a break All that. right. You want some water? Yes. Our mayor wants to say something to our audience. You want some water? Yes. Stay right here. Don't okay. worry. Okay. Just going to take the mic a minute. Um, as you can see at the Oscars, they change their clothes. Same clothes, different hat. So you'll see different hats on me. Uh, <laughs> there is a hat contest, and we have our judges. So if you have your hats, put them on because they're going to walk around. Three prizes for hat contest. So please, yeah, put your hats on. Cool. Um, and we'll do that during the break when, before the brides come out. We'll give you a few minutes after that. You can buy some more tickets, and we'll have the break. We'll do the hat contest, and you'll do the brides finale, Bye. and then we'll pull the tickets. So I just wanted to let everybody know. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you. Thanks. Oh. And I do have a special proclamation for Jenny that I will be giving to her at the end of the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have Emily back. And you have to admit, this outfit is absolutely gorgeous. This is a typical, typical gown of the glamorous Hollywood look of the 30s, and it's worn by Emily. The long black chiffon fitted gown is worn over a black satin slip, and the wet look jacket features very puffy short sleeves and wide lapels. The hemline is also trimmed with this very wide band of the same wet look fabric. This outfit would be, not be complete without a hat, long black sleeves, and a cigarette holder. I call this outfit my Jean Harlow outfit. Doesn't she look like Jean Harlow? Hollywood had a, was a tremendous influence on the fashion scene. It was an era of sophistication Eyebrows were penciled in, mascara and lipstick were generously used, and other Hollywood influences were Joan Crawford, 
who wore short shorts that resembled hot pants of a later era, and high school girls wore Angora sweaters emulating Ginger Rogers. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> that, I have to mention too, was a gift to me by my dear friend Ruthie Cowan. And now we have Michelle back. Michelle has been very busy. The fabric of this gown, is, this is from 1940, and it's a silk print. The designer actually cut out designs from the same fabric, decorated them with sequins, and placed them in strategic areas of the gown. Minimum gathering is evident below the natural waistline on each side of the front. A long sleeve bolero with padded shoulders completes this gorgeous gown that Michelle is modeling for us. This is another fashion from Flossie Lapointe. Thank you, Michelle. And she's carrying a beautiful little glass purse. And here we're coming right along. Another glamorous look of the 30s is worn by Fleur. She is wearing a heavy beaded sequin jacket over a white crepe gown. The long sleeve jacket is adorned with multicolored sequins that are sewn into a bright, bold floral pattern. And a zipper closes the front. And notice the same little designs from the jacket are on the straps of the gown. A little uh, a bias cut panel sewn in the back. I guess you noticed that. And this kind of flares out in the back. And it shows the, how fabrics can be trained to drape. And she's wearing no. <laughs> uh, this is another outfit from my Flossie LaPointe collection. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. <laughs> this sleeveless red velvet dress features a slim waist and full flowing skirt. Fancy white lace trim appears across the top of the, of the bodice and the low cut neckline. Both are studded with rhinestones. This is a very form fitting, beautiful gown that Jessica is wearing for a fun evening out. This one was given to me by my daughter in law, Denise Pilot's mother. This was one of uh, the, her favorite clothes in her collection that she uh, gave to me for mine. And she's wearing a beautiful little silver purse. Thank you very much. Vicki is wearing a suit that was designed by Lily Ann of San Francisco and Paris. The silk wool fabric features a fitted jacket with wide, white piping around the collar. And a small tab with tiny buttons decorates the lapels. The same piping and tab decoration uh, de decorate the cuffs. Three rhinestone buttons close the jacket in front and the straight line skirt features a kick plate, a kick pleat in the back. And she wears a pillbox hat to complete this very chic outfit. Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> After the war, World War II, nylon became a very, very available fabric. It was used extensively 
in inter intimate fashions as well as regular fashions. And Lori is wearing a dress from the early 50s. This one is an original wash and wear garment. The dress is sleeveless with a cummerbund waist and both bodice and waist have pin tucks and the skirt is accordion pleated. The neckline dips to a V and back. She's wearing a white uh, necklace and bracelet to finish off this lovely look. I can attest to its wash and wear because it was one of my dresses and it was washed and drip dried many times. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. And Elise is here wearing a dress that is similar to one that Marilyn Monroe wore in the seven year itch. The halter neck style came in many fabrics during the decade of the 50s, and this one is polyester. It has a very full skirt, and two wide belts of the same fabric are attached to each side of the dress, and they wrap around in front. Marilyn Monroe was a major sex symbol, starring in a number of commercially successful motion pictures during the 50s until her untimely death in 1962. Thank you, Ali. I am so proud of my children and grandchildren who are so good about sharing my passion for passion. Passion for fashion. <laughs> Okay, now we have a lovely chiffon, aqua chiffon short sleeve dress with a full skirt with a nipped in waist and beaded uh, bodice. And the bodice has an illusion of a princess style. She's modeling this dress with a crystal necklace and bracelet. And she is certainly expecting to have a great time wearing this beautiful dress. And I would like to mention that in uh, the late 40s, Christian Dior came out with what they called the new look. And it had the cinched waist and the full skirt. And some of you might remember that some of these dresses that came out required a special undergarment, like a, like a corset, and it was called the, the widow's, uh, the Mary Widow's Foundation. It was, it was awful. <laughs> but of course, Make sure you speak our model would not have to use such a garment. <laughs> Thank you. That was so nice. Now, Emily is back. This is another granddaughter, and she's wearing us a blue and white floral print cocktail dress from my closet from the late 50s and early 60s. After Hawaii became our 50th state in 1959, prints such as this one became popular. The figure is well defined with a fitted belted waistline and the bias cut allows for the soft flow of silk fabric to drape down the back of this dress, down from the uh, neckline to the waistline. This shows the importance of fabric that is bias cut. A complete, to complete this effect, this dress has, uh, that our model wears, uh, she has white gloves and she's carrying a beaded purse. This one was made in Belgium, the, uh, the purse I'm speaking of, the purse was made in Belgium by uh, Wahlberg Company. This was 
Very, very lovely. Thank you so much, Emily. This fashion that's coming up next is a very important fashion for teenagers of the 1950s. And I think as soon as she comes out, you'll, I won't have to describe it. You'll know exactly what it is if she comes out. <laughs> Here she is. This is Jessica, and she's wearing the ever popular poodle skirt. These swirling skirts were decorated with many types of appliques and were worn over a crinoline slip that was uh, accompanying the, the uh, skirt, and she's wearing a uh, Pop it beads, can you pop those beads for us? <laughs> and she's carrying a 3D feckard. And to make a comment, teenagers wore things like this and they had to have saddle shoes when they wore the poodle skirt. And they also swooned over Elvis Presley. Other fads of the decade were hoops, hula hoops, 45 vinyl records, 3D movies, poodle haircuts. These were some of the fads of the 50s. Thank you. Now Flora's back. This beautiful floral print halter top dress, has a very full skirt, and it's uh, under, under her skirt she shows a very full slip that makes that skirt just flare out beautifully. The cotton fabric features a colorful floral and fauna design. Small rhinestones can be seen on the bodice that gives it a dressy look. Our model, Fleur, is wearing a snood with rhinestones in her hair. It's a simple bracelet she carries, a Whiting Davis purse. Women wearing snoods were very popular the, the snoods were very popular in the 40s and 50s. And a snood, in case you don't know, is a hairpiece made of various fabrics that covers a decorative manner in your hair. Thank you. So sweet. And now, my daughter-in-law, Linda, is back. Geometric and op art designs were inspired many clothing designers to featured costumes such as this stunning black and white wool dress and coat ensemble. <laughs> Linda points out the dramatic coat lining to reveal the matching dress. The dress is sleeveless and has a long zipper that closes the back. This is another fashion by Lily Ann of San Francisco and Paris. Other interesting uh, items of note during the 60s were paper dresses with matching napkins and placemats and score cab cards, mini skirts, colored stockings, pantyhose and boots. Also, Betty Friedan of Women's Love, Lib, Feminine Mystique and Make Love, Not War was constantly in the news. This is another one of my personal outfits that I might add is my favorite. In 
1966, Pree's Department Store of Mount Clemens, maybe some of you might remember that far back, they had a popular, they were a popular uh, store in Mount Clemens, and at that time they held a fashion show where this bright, fun, one-piece pant outfit that Michelle is wearing was featured. At that show, the outfit was worn by Miss Marion Vadio. She was the grandmother of Lynette Marsek, owner of Kratz Flowers in Mount Clemens. Marion owned Marjo's Restaurant, which was located in the 15-mile area, and this outfit has been in the Marsak family for over 50 years. There is an interesting flair to this costume. A cape effect flows softly down to the wide leg pants. This is more evident when Michelle turns and show us the back. And narrow beaded ribbon follows the neckline down to the right side of this lovely and very unusual costume. The Marsex gave this outfit to me for my collection, but due to its ties to Pree's department store, they gave me permission to donate it to Crocker House. Kim Parr, director of Crocker House, generously loaned it to me for this show today. Thank you, Nikki. Sue is back, and she's wearing one of her personal dresses from the 60s. I think I mentioned that Sue has been a model for me for many, many, many years. And she also is fond of vintage clothes, and, and she's a collector, and she decided to let us see her 1960 dress. This belted dress is white lace over yellow satin. There are 16 rhinestone buttons which close at the front. The dress features a V-neckline and long sleeves. The sleeves are decorated with the same rhinestone buttons as the cuffs. Topping off this, uh, this look, she's wearing a lovely lace hat. Thank you, Sue. Very nice. And Vicki is back, and this time she's wearing a sack dress. And as you notice, it's quite dramatic with its uh, white sleeves and a very, very straight line dress. Sack dresses were very popular, and it was noted many times. We have sacks on the wrap. And they were made of all types of different fabrics. But this one happens to be a very kind of a cocktail looking one. And she has a matching hat, which is satin with a white border. Thank you, Vicki. Very nice. The 60s gave us many styles to choose from. One of the most popular of this one is a very short two-piece mini outfit that Emily is wearing. The fabric resembles those of the 30s that were bias cut, as many costumes from that era were. There are many gores in this flared skirt, and the bodice has long sleeves, and it buttons down the front with fabric-covered buttons and loop closures. Emily carries another fashion of the time, a macrame bag, and is wearing a crocheted hat. The decade was also known as, were also known for hippies, flower children, uh, and tent dresses, and, and many, many different style dresses. Thank you, Emily. The hippies made a contribution to the fashion world with jeans, beads and macrame, 
But the 60s cleaned up the act, and a fashionable denim became the rage. This was, this was the rage of the beautiful people of the jet set. Many were embroidered with uh, flowers and appliques, and this one that Emily is wearing has very wide-legged, smooth-fitting pants with a long sleeve jacket that's trimmed with large red buttons and embroidered red roses. Thank you, Emily. We have Maya back. Red, white, and blue were the colors of 1976, celebrating America's bicentennial birthday. This wash and wear nylon heart pattern, uh, one piece uh, belted mini skirt, is, it's permanently pleated and it zips down the front. And to show her patriotism, our model, Maya, waves the American flag. God bless America. Thank you, Maya. Now we have Linda back, and she is wearing, Linda is wearing a jumpsuit. This one is a very, very comfortable outfit. A zipper closes the bodice down to the waistline, and the attached white, the attached wide-legged pants feature accordion pleats from the waist to the hemlines. A narrow belt ties around the waist, and a colorful scarf is tied around her neck. Thank you, Linda. There was a definite American Indian influence during the 70s. People also became very ecology-minded and eager to save the earth. Popular fads were water beds, pet rocks, mood rings, fondue pots, and hibachis. And here's quick change Michelle back. <laughs> And she's wearing a very fashionable, fashionable olive green and white silk print dress, which was designed by Adele Simpson. This happens to be our model's favorite dress from my collection, as it reminds her of her mother. The dress features dolman sleeves and has attached wrap across, uh, round, wrap around sash that ties in the front. Adele Simpson was an American designer with a successful career that spanned five decades. She also was a child performer in vaudeville where she danced in productions with Milton Berle and other equally famous entertainers. Thank you, Michelle. That's beautiful on you. And now we have Elise back. She's wearing a black wool beaded gown that was purchased at Park Lane, a fashionable, popular woman's store that was located many years ago in downtown Mount Clemens. The sleek line of the design that she's wearing is elegant in its simplicity. It's tastefully trimmed with glass buttons on the bodice and along the hemline. A cerulean fur stow is worn, and well as long black gloves and a purse that completes this outfit. Beaded gowns were popular during this time because of imports from the Orient. We walked, we ran, we rode bicycles that took us nowhere, and we danced to disco music. All this to reduce stress, inches, and money in our wallets. Thank you, Elise. <laughs> <coughs> Flip.
Fleur is back, and she's showing us another fashion designed by Adele Simpson. This one is from the 80s. This dramatic white and silver silk brocade, brocade gown has a large floral design throughout. The, the simple line is straight. Lined, the uh, gown is sleeveless. It features a, neck, a uh, V neckline and has a natural waist. And it has a rope style belt that ties in the front. This is a perfect example where simplicity coupled with color, textile, and design work work together to create a memorable fashion statement. Thank you, Fleur. And this is a good time to feature a a uh, prom gown, and this one is from the 1990s, and Lori is wearing just that. And she's on her way to her prom in this striking, fanciful, and bright net ball gown. The skirt of the gown has three layers. Bottom layer is satin, middle layer is netting, and top layer is chiffon. The cummerbund style bodice has chiffon straps with an attached collar that drapes around the front and continues to a low neck in the back, ending with a short train at the back. This will be a memorable night for Laurie, and she has a beautiful corsage, wrist corsage, also popular for the graduation gals. Thank you, Laurie. <clears throat> Kathy is back and she's wearing a lovely long floral print skirt. <coughs> the fabric is ran over a silk attached slip. The skirt features a low dropped overlay and a handkerchief hemline. The color is, is, uh, of this and is a dramatic uh, uh, floral patterns, and it, it has this very, very popular uneven hemline that was very popular during the year. <clears throat> Chico's was founded in 1983. This gown has a Chico label. And in uh, 1980, 1983, Chico's was a small boutique selling Mexican folk art in Sanibel Island, Florida. As the new century ap ap approached, it expanded their inventory to include fashionable, easy fit, and careful clothing for women of all sizes and ages. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Now we are going to have a short break now, and then after the break we have a very wonderful list of wedding dresses to show you. Okay. Is that right? Yep. We're going to turn it over to uh, the hat contest. Our judges today were Laura Fournier. She is a city commissioner for the city of Mount Clements, first term. Let's hear it for Laura. Cool. <laughs> Our other judge who is getting one of the winners uh, is Denise Manser. She is also a city commissioner, second term. Okay. And we have Teresa from the library, uh, Mount Clemens Library. Are you, are you coming? Yeah. She's, um, she's kind of learning a lot about the historic, uh, historical Mount Clemens because Debbie Larson, who is in the back, who has been one wonderful 
assistant librarian. She is retiring in October. And we're so sad to see her go, but I really wish her luck in her retirement. And Therese is going to take over, so just want to introduce them. Okay, we're going to start with the third prize winner. And who's the third prize? Right here. Right here? Okay, this is our third prize winner. Let me just say, it was a very difficult choice, but look at the back of her hat. <laughs> the prizes they are receiving are from our Champagne Chocolates in downtown Mount Clemens. And if you've never been there, if you're missing out, go there, get some great chocolates. Okay, our second prize winner. Oh my gosh, I know this lady. <laughs> yeah, because I'll trip right over it. Come on, uh, this is Ethel. Come on, Jill, Ethel. Now, hey, Jill Hansiger designed the hat. Okay. Just, you have to walk out and. You show have to the walk hat. out and show your hat. Jill, where are you? Jill, she said you you designed the hat. So wherever you are. Okay. This is Ethel. Just handcrafted. That's right. Uh, I'll carry it. Yeah, we'll I can't look for it. I'll carry it. We'll get it down for you. We'll get it down for you. Okay, come on, Lou. And our first prize hat winner is Lou Moss. Come on out. Lou is with the Clinton Township Optimist, very active in the community, and we will be presenting her with a shoe full of truffles, champagne, chocolate. champagne chocolates. If you're, if you're ever looking for any kind of special um, gift you want to give somebody, Champagne chocolates can do anything you want in a mold. She does shoes, hats, teapots, anything you want. So please um, take an opportunity. And the chocolate is really good. Eh, what can I say? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for all the hat wearers. Thank you for our judges. Appreciate it. Now what about my hat? Different? Which one do you like? I have three now. Which one? First one? Second? Third? <laughs> I said I can't change outfits quick enough, you know. <laughs> but hats I can do. Let me find out where they are. Raffle tickets, they're still being sold. So if anybody still wants raffle tickets, Laura is selling them. I think Denise was selling them amp in the back so I hope you're enjoying the show I think it's wonderful that Jenny um, Curtola decided um, that this was going to be I mean it's not wonderful that it's her last show but I think it's wonderful to the fact that she decided to have her grand finale during the Mount Clemens Bicentennial Maya is our first model wearing a wedding dress. This is a this is a two layered two layered dress from eight from eighteen ninety. The outer layer is heavily embroidered. It's in, uh, and the uh, length of the dress, I'm having a little trouble seeing here. The, the dress, the bodice is slightly gathered at the neck and at the waist, 
and the skirt of the gown drapes in the front and continues around to the back with a slightly longer creating a train effect. A short net veil has a lace crown hat that is embellished with silk flowers. She's wearing a vintage gold cameo necklace. Our model, our beautiful bride is Maya. Thank you so much. Maya has shown us some beautiful costumes during this show. Our next model is Jessica. And Jessica is wearing a T-length dress. And it's, uh, it's a wedding dress that is worn over a nude colored sleeve, uh, slip. And it features a small scalloped embroidered collar that begins in the shoulder and it extends to the back of the neckline. The collar is embellished with two silk flowers in front. There's a small keyhole back with satin covered buttons. And a self satin belt is attached at the front and it ties, it, it's attached and wraps around to the front and ties in the front. And a net veil is attached to a lace box crown that is embellished with numerous pearls that are patterned to resemble flowers. Thank you, Jessica. This ivory satin T-length wedding dress was loaned to me by Nancy Hank. Her mother, Beatrice, wore it when she married Alfred Hank, a well-known resident of Mount Clemens. Those of us who have been here long enough will remember the Hank photo, photograph studio. The skirt of this dress is a dropped waist with two attached satin flowers. The skirt of this gown is short in front and longer in back. Lace follows all around the neckline of the boat line and to a V-neck in the back. There are three panels from the neckline to the waist that graduate in size. The complete, this uh, bodice to the, is a seven snap closure in the dress on the left side and a large satin bow attaches to the back to finish off this classy look. Lori is a descendant of Alfred and Beatrice. Thank you, Lori. This lovely gown, it's satin, which was a very popular fabric during the 40s. This beautiful gown features dramatic puff sleeves and long train at the back. Seven, satin covered buttons with loop closures fasten the gown at the back and on the long sleeves. Decorative smocking trims the bodice. Our bride, Emily, wears a double strand of pearls and a simple let net veil and that is attached to a chiffon island crown that is encrusted with pearls. Thank you, Emily. And now we have a very special gown that we're featuring. This long sleeved lace over heavy satin, it's a hooped wedding gown, and Elise is wearing this, and it's the gown when, of Shirley Champion, who wore it on her wedding day in 1957. The gown features a scalloped V neckline and zipped in the back. This long sleeves taper from the shoulders to the zipper closures at the wrists. The crown of her short veil is embellished with lace and pearls and crystal beads. 
Our beautiful 1957 bride, Shirley, is in the audience this afternoon. What a treat to have her here to celebrate Mount Clemens. And she is going to be presented with a bouquet. Now, where, I can't see where Shirley is, but somebody can, there we are. Shirley is right up there. She's probably with a lot of Garden Club members, maybe. And we were so happy that we were able to show her wedding dress. Shirley's a very wonderful Mount Clement, Mount Clementites, I like to call. Very, very uh, uh, wonderful Garden Club member and a wonderful citizen of Mount Clemens. And now we have a lovely uh, wedding gown from 1980. Marin is wearing a two-piece cotton print outfit from, this, from the, uh, uh, yes. This is, this is, uh, this, this, uh, features a uh, full skirt and has a small buckle effect in the back. The bodice has long sleeves and buttons down the back with tiny glass buttons. Pin tucks I'm not showing the right one, am I? <laughs> Oh, here it is. Okay, we got to start this one over. I was on a roll before I quit, so I got to get back in the groove, okay? Okay, Fleur is wearing this, and this is from 1960. It's a three-tiered lace over heavy satin, ruffled wedding dress. It was a very fashionable with the flower children of the 60s. The natural waistline is belted with a satin ribbon. Silk flowers are attached at the shoulder. Fleur is wearing a halo style headpiece with silk flowers attached. A more beautiful bride could not, it could be hard, hard to find. Thank you, Fleur. Sorry I screwed you up. And now we have my granddaughter, Emily. And she's wearing the gown her mother wore when she married, when, when her parents were married. This all lace over satin bridal gown has a simple satin band, collar and cuffs, and a decorative satin two inch strip runs down the front of the gown and attached to it are 34 satin covered decorative buttons. This gown zips down the back and has a long train. The train during the reception can be attached to the back of the gown with two satin covered buttons. The romantic cathedral length Mantia style lace trimmed veil completes this gorgeous look. Thank you, Emily. And now we have Michelle. When this gown came into my collection, I decided it would be perfect for our winter wedding. And Michelle Shell is showing just that. A full skirt gathers below the cummerbund waist and a dramatic faux six-inch fur band 
circles the hemline on this beautiful gown from Fa Saks Fifth Avenue. The gown also features long sleeves and a low V neckline. Instead of a veil, our bride is wearing a mink pillbox hat. This gown was a gift to me from Doris Carmody, along with some other costumes that she gave to me. I am sure you will agree that this is a great addition to my collection. This is not only the end of our show, but it's our grand finale. And in a moment, the other models will come out. But I want to mention about my fashions. Fashion throughout the ages have been incredibly, an incredible journey these 50 plus years. Not only have I met an army of wonderful people on missions to help their chair organizations and charities, I have enjoyed and greatly appreciated all my lovely models over the years. Their enthusiasm contributed to the success popularity of the show. I'm very honored to have participated in this celebration of the bicentennial of Mount Clemens, a city I have loved my entire life. I hope you all enjoyed the show. Perhaps it brought back some wonderful memories of your yesteryear, your mothers, grandmothers, aunts, and uncles, and a new vintage point each time you go into your closet. Sooner or later, everything becomes vintage. So say, hang on to your favorites. Thank you, and have a special day. And now we are going to see a little parade of our models. Kathy and Emily and Sue and Linda and Rhea. So and Mar Marin and Marin is going to pass out the, uh, some roses to the ladies as you leave the uh, theater. And she also has, is wearing a lovely two-piece vintage costume. May, are you still there? I mean, uh, Ma Marin, are you still there? This is Marin. She offered to pass out roses for us. And she's, we're so happy that she volunteered to do this. So I guess you'll notice that most of the models, or many of the models, uh, wore many outfits besides their wedding dresses. But I hope you all enjoyed all of the various wedding dresses that we're showing you, and all of the vintage fashions that we presented today. And thank you again for being here for my very last vintage fashion show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Everyone stay, please. I know you're going to take the pictures, right? Bear with me. I will. <laughs> okay. I have, they've bared with me all okay. this show. <laughs> Wonderful. They've been a very good audience. They have been. Yes. Thank you so much. This is a proclamation for Jenny. So I'm going to, it, it is a little lengthy. I'm going to read it fast, but I want, I think it's important to take the time and recognize someone who has given so much to our city. So, the people of Mount Clemens through their duly elected officials have a long history of recognizing those individuals in their midst who give of themselves for the human and public good. And Virginia 
Jenny Cotola, moved to Mount Clemens in 1954 with her husband, Dr. Victor Cotola, and her five children. And whereas almost immediately, Jenny immersed herself in the various volunteer projects for not only organizations in Macomb County, specifically Mount Clemens, but throughout the Detroit metro area as well. Whereas these projects represented well-known communities and charitable organizations such as the United Way Volunteer Council, for which she served as president at one point, and the Macomb County Medical Society, the St. Joseph uh, Hospital Auxiliary, where she was also served as president from 1961 to 1962, the co-president in 1991 to 92, the St. Joseph Auxiliary Nursing Scholarship Committee, and the Macomb County Historical Society, the Anton Arts Center, and the Mount Clements Garden Club. You guys are here. Garden Club, where are you? <laughs> and whereas, in addition, Jenny co-founded the garage Rama and served as co-chairwoman and committee volunteer for the Medallion Ball for many years. And whereas her private and impressive collection of vintage clothing is primarily utilized as fundraising tools for various organizations and charities all throughout Metro Detroit. Whereas her fashion show, Fashions of Yesteryear, features clothing and accessories dating from 1880 up to today, Jenny, is, Jenny has presented well over 50 shows over her years. And whereas Jenny has been recognized throughout the years by the Macomb County Historical Society Certificate of Appreciation in 1980 to 1988, the Michigan First Lady Award in 1987, presented by Paula Blanchard, and the First Lady Barbara Bush, and the Medallion Ball Award in 1990 for her volunteer effort endeavors to ensure organizations and charities succeed. And whereas all this was done while raising five children, which in, in, entailed being involved in many various school and recreational events, Jenny is still, after 64 years, continuing her efforts to work toward making sure Mount Clemens, Macomb County, and Detroit, Metro Detroit are the best they can be. Now, therefore, I, Barb Dempsey, Mayor of the City of Mount Clemens, on behalf of the City Commission and all our citizens, do hereby extend to Virginia Jenny Cotola this expression of our sincere appreciation for her efforts and being such an active, contributing member of our community. The City of Mount Clemens has been fortunate to benefit from Mrs. Cotola's efforts and everything she has done throughout her years. And for her to choose this venue to be her last venue of all of this beautiful clothing means so much to the city of Mount Clemens. Thank you so, so much. this oh. is for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so much for this wonderful proclamation. This has been such a wonderful day for me. You know what, Jenny? I have to take you out here because you're you're not very tall like me. So come out here. Oh, okay. They want a picture of the full venue here. Okay. okay I, I promised her to bring out. Let's do this. Do you want to say anything before we move on? Oh, would you like to say anything before yes. we move on? Please do. Again, I want to thank all my beautiful models that presented the show for you today. You have to admit, they all did a spectacular job. And I can't thank them enough. Thank you very much to all of you. This has been my passion for fashion 
has been a, a wonderful thing, just, just a part of my volunteer life. And uh, I've enjoyed everything that I have done, and I've enjoyed the city of Mount Clemens and the county of, of uh, Macomb. And I'm just very pleased to be here today and to, at this particular venue. It is so beautiful, and the decorations are, were, I was dumbfounded when I walked in and saw how beautiful the stage, staging was done. And of course, my daughter, Karen, my right arm. This couldn't happen if she wasn't involved over the many years. Thank you, thank you, thank you.